Our guest today is Dr. Robert Murphy. He has a PhD in economics from NYU. Uh, he's president uh, of, consul of a consulting by RPM, and he's a senior economist at the Institute for Energy Research. Uh, he's also author of hundreds of articles, including the, one of my favorites, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, and he's a senior fellow at the Mises Institute teaching online courses there. So, Bob, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me, guys. How's it going? I, w I hope you feel honored. This is the, you're our first guest in our new studio here. This has taken uh, months of logistics to uh, take place, and you're kind of a hard guy to get a hold of. You've been doing a lot of traveling, I, I know. Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad to be here with you guys, and congratulations on the new uh, the new digs. Thank you. By the way, uh, you're teaching a course at Mises uh, in later April on how the government wrecks the economy. What a what a wonderful topic, yeah, Bob. Very timely. Uh, give us a preview. Uh, let's get into that a little bit. Give us some of the high points of maybe some of the topics you're going to be discussing, and and whet our appetite uh, for this class. Sure thing. So yeah, it's going to be a, a six-week course, and if people want to see it, it's at academy.mises.org is where they can get all this information. And it's what I'm doing in it is going through the final third of my textbook called Lessons for the Young Economist. Okay. And, and the, the PDF of that is available online for free if people want to look that up as well. And so I just walk through it, what this is. It's supposed to be a textbook. It, it's suitable for people as young as junior high, but even adults who, who never – really studied economics say they get a lot out of it. And I just walked through some of the main points as to why government intervention, as the title suggests, wrecks the economy. So it starts out with just pure socialism and gives the theory as to why socialism doesn't work and then reviews the historical record, which a lot of people just have never been taught this. Just literally the body count of socialism in the 20th century is in the millions. And I don't even mean just like in a war. I mean like socialist governments purposely killing their own people for political reasons. The body count is in the millions. And so we just walk through that. And then in the final section, we just go through some uh, standard things that happen even in Western democracies, things like price controls, um, you know, minimum wage laws, rent control, uh, things, drug prohibition, just the, the economics of that and explaining why it is that there were gangsters involved in the alcohol trade when alcohol was prohibited, that sort of thing. And then we also wrap up with uh, some more complex topics, namely inflation, like where does inflation come from, and the the causes of the business cycle. And so there I give the, the Austrian school approach, saying that it's actually central, the central bank's manipulation of money and banking that causes what we, what we refer to as the business cycle. Well, let, let's, let, let's talk about one particular topic, um, which is why socialism doesn't work. Mises very clearly laid out. Uh, a totally different philosophy than the Keynesians, uh, which is you can't do calculation. You, you don't have any pricing discovery mechanisms in socialism when there's just massive government intervention into, into the marketplace. Uh, the Austrians differentiate that very distinctly, but how come the Keynesians think they can get away with some of these uh, faux forms of socialism we see to be creeping toward? Well, you're exactly right that this... Uh, goes back to, and, and that's what I talk about even in the book. Of course, I, I try to use uh, language accessible to as low as junior high students, but it is drawing on what was it's called the socialist calculation debate, and that occurred in the early 1900s. As you mentioned, Ludwig von Mises, he sort of launched this new salvo in the war between the market economy and socialism, because up till that point, the debate had been over incentives. You know, people who were opponents of socialism as as it was being propounded in the late 1800s, we're saying, oh, come on, if, if people are just getting their cut uh, out of what the common pool, well, then why would anyone have an incentive to go to work? And, and, you know, that sort of thing, which is all very, very true. But Mises said that's not the fundamental problem, that even if all the comrades in a socialist society just, you know, obeyed their orders with enthusiasm, Still, socialism doesn't work because they lack market prices and the means of production that basically businesses and managers can't engage in, in a profit and loss calculation. And so they would just have no idea if they're efficiently using resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they could look and see, OK, yeah, we're having this much steel go in, this much rubber, this much electricity and outs popping this many cars per month. But they would have no way of knowing, should we keep doing this or is this wasting our resources? Because that's what the profit and loss signals give you in a market economy. 
And so to answer your question, I think the reason that Austrians are more attuned to that sort of problem, whereas Keynesians would not be, is that in the sort of mathematical models that Keynesians typically use to describe the economy, these sorts of issues don't come up. Because if you just have a few variables in there and you're modeling the economy as just a big pile of of capital and a big pile of labor, and there's a simple mathematical function combining them to give you the output, well, then it's easy to have a government official tweak things and make it better than that silly old market will do. But when you get more realistic about how things are in the real world, then you see the essential role that market prices play and why you need profit and loss accounting to help guide entrepreneurs make the right decisions. Well, I think we're seeing that in the market today with quantitative easing. We have massive intervention in, into the credit market, uh, sending signals to entrepreneurs, many of which have made malinvestments with, from these signals because of the government intervention. I think the housing crisis was a per- perfect example of that, and it blew up in the Keynesian's face. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And what, perhaps one way of, of putting the matter is to say that when you see people nowadays uh, arguing over the effects of quantitative easing and so on and, and the Fed's uh, zero interest rate policy, most economists, especially the Keynesians, will say, well, look at CPI is not going through the roof. And so therefore, obviously, there's no there's no fallout from the Fed's policies. In other words, they think yeah. the only bad thing that could possibly happen from pushing interest rates down to zero is that prices might start rising too rapidly and that kind of messes things up. And so they realize, oh, well, if you're if you're pushing the gas too hard and you overheat the economy, when the Austrians have a much more nuanced view and realize that the interest rate serves a very important coordinating function. And if the interest rate's supposed to be 3%, but instead it's 0.25%, that's going to screw things up. Entrepreneurs are going to make the wrong investments. And so it's not just a matter of some aggregate like CPI that the BLS puts out and what's the percentage change of that? I mean, that that's a very crude thing that the interest rate is, is just a market price. And so if that's the wrong number for several years in a row, that's going to screw things up. Yeah. And, you know, for, for me, Robert, it comes down to trust as well. We had a gentleman on the program a couple of weeks ago talking about, he actually worked for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. He was more on the employment data, um, but was talking uh, jobs data. And he said, you know, a lot of times this stuff is cooked and those numbers are are slightly tweaked to fit the agenda. So even though we have CPI and PPI data coming out for the BLS, we'd have to raise your eyebrow and say, well, what exactly are we getting here? Is this economic data really enough to make a long-term investment on or an economic decision or even from an entrepreneurial perspective to grow my business based off these numbers when they may not even be true. So let's let's take a quick break. Uh, I'd like to dive into that when we come back after a short break. Also, we had a listener question. I'll just kind of set this up here so I give you a commercial break to think about it. Um, gentleman was saying, look, the Keynesian economics that we have right now, the banks, they can went out and bailed out the big banks, and they did a great job because if we didn't do that, we'd have a huge you know, collapse of the financial system. So why is it that we're so, uh, I guess, anti, not anti-Keynesianism, but pointing the finger at the Keynesians and saying, look, you're doing things wrong. Uh, why would it have been better to potentially have let these banks fall apart, go uh, kind of uh, fix a problem on their own organically and maybe do an Austrian approach? We'll look at that when we come back. Our guest today is Robert Murphy. Uh, John O'Donnell is here in studio with me. If you have questions for Robert, John, or myself, Power Blast is out at PowerTradingRadio.com. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio Live and your host, Merlin Rothfeld, with today's special guest. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio. Merlin Rothfeld in with John O'Donnell. For our weekend edition, our guest today is Robert Murphy. And um, Robert, I have a couple questions. One, I, I said it before the commercial break there, which was we had a listener uh, a couple weeks ago send in a question. And obviously, we're an Austrian-friendly show. I think that uh, John and I both believe that there should be a cleanup of this, the rampant spending and just kind of look at the way we're doing things uh, from a government level on down and fix that before we start uh, down this continue down this path of just reckless spending. And he said, look, the Fed... The government bailing out the banks, bailing out AIG, bailing out General Motors and, and all these companies was a great thing to do because now, look, we're back on the road to prosperity. But what we've done in the meantime is amass an incredible amount of debt and encourage people to build up businesses and fail. And we, we kind of raised the issue, look, that wasn't the right approach. I'm curious from your perspective, what would be the Austrian approach and what might be the benefits of it? Sure. Well, I think what I'm going to say is compatible with what sounds like how what your position has been. Uh, the standard Austrian view is to say that the, the government has no business picking winners and losers, that 
as of let's say the when the crisis fully manifested itself in the fall of 2008 yes things would have been bad if the fed and the federal government had just stood back and done nothing right but the point is that's because real mail investments had been made during the housing bubble that uh people had invested improperly and so of course people are going to slap their heads when they realize that and say oh my gosh we're not as wealthy as we thought we were we made a bunch of bad mistakes and so you don't undo those mistakes by having the fed create a bunch of money out of nothing and buy up those investments and then bail out the people who made the mistakes and have the federal government borrow a bunch of money and spend it on political projects that's not you don't help anything you don't make the economy richer by doing those sorts of things so what would have happened there would have been a short term crisis and it would have been bad and unemployment would have gone way up but and a lot of businesses would have gone under including a lot of the major investment banks but there would have been bankruptcy proceedings. Real resources would not have been destroyed just because a company goes out of business. It's just the creditors would have you know, divvied up the assets mm -hmm. as best they could to pay off um, the, the bondholders and so forth. And the, the primary benefit of that is that the companies that had been responsible during the housing bubble years, the ones in the financial sector that sort of you know, didn't get too aggressively involved with mortgage-backed securities because they knew – you know, this we're gambling with fire here. Let's just not get too heavily involved with it. This this surely isn't going to last. Those firms then would have had dominant market share, and so the system would have worked. It's a profit and loss system, and the lesson would have been learned that okay, yeah, the next time a, a bubble comes around, you don't want to get involved too heavily in it because look what happened to all those guys that got crushed in two thousand eight. But now the lesson is, you got to go ahead and, and pay huge bonuses and get in while the getting's good when there's a bubble on the way up and then make sure you're politically connected so that you get bailed out if things blow up in your face. And that's hardly the lesson you want uh, entrepreneurs to be learning. Yeah, I think, I, I think the message of capitalism is there's, there's a place for failure, yeah. that the role of recessions and, and depressions is to, and, and credit purging cycles is to wipe out the inefficient producers. People forget, in our, in our rail industry as an example, uh, I did a recent paper on our, the history of the capitalization of our rail industry. We've had 2,000 bankruptcy procedures in the rail industry. We've had 300 automobile companies go out of business. Uh, there, there's a place for reorganization. I remember, Merlin, remember when we had all the ISPs out there? Yeah. We had hundreds of online brokerage firms that merged, purged, failed, and we've got a handful of them about five that have uh, emerged with maybe 70, 80% market share. But there is a place for failure in a capitalistic system. And, and that includes the banks. And, and I mean, you know, if Citibank had gone under, you don't, you don't think our country isn't overbanked anyway? I mean, think about it for a moment. Somebody would have picked up, they would have went through bankruptcy, they would have cleansed uh, all those credit instruments, uh, secured and unsecured creditors would have divvied up uh, the spoils of uh, the you know the bankruptcy attorneys would have walked away rich, and banking would have gone on in America. But you know, it, so I, I think there's a place for failure it's, it's in capitalism. It's a function of capitalism. The problem, and I think this is where you're going, Robert, is that there seems to be um, a improper practice of encouraging failure and rewarding it. I mean, some of these guys took risks that were so stellar that it was just unbelievable what they were doing. There's, their entire business collapses and, you know, they take down the general taxpayer with it, but they're the ones that get rewarded to just kind of just jump ship and, and be happy making their hundreds of millions of dollars and, and everybody else suffers for it. That, that to me is wrong and there should be some, uh, you know, criminal proceedings against some of these guys that really knew what they were doing and brought their companies down willingly. Yeah, and also I think another important point to make in this is it's not that I'm saying, oh, yes, the, the Fed and the federal government's interventions – prevented a really bad adjustment process but you know that that offends my moral sensibilities no i'm i'm saying that all they did was postpone it right. we are still going to have a much and now a much yeah. worse uh, day of reckoning than what would have yeah. happened in late 2008 had they not come in and done all those extraordinary measures so it's not that they spared us the pain they just deferred it and it's going to be that much worse are, are, yeah because the concentrated risk now there's more deposits yeah in the hands of fewer bank brands today than there was pre-crisis. So all I've really done is concentrated the problem for the next day of reckoning. Yeah, I mean, it just, maybe this is a simplistic way of looking at it, but, you know, there was the dot-com crash in 2000 and around then, 2001, 
and then they replaced that with the housing bubble. And then that crashed and that you know put in jeopardy major investment banks. And then I think the next crisis is going to be that you know the euro itself might go down. You know, so now it's like whole currencies that are at risk, and maybe the Fed will bail them out and so on. But so that each each cycle, the the th- the threat just keeps getting bigger and bigger. You know, in, in two thousand eight, if people said at that point, what if we had just endured the dot com crash instead of giving us the housing bubble? Everybody would have thought that would have been a walk in the park. So I'm saying, the next crisis that's coming may make what was going to happen in 2008 look like a walk in the park. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny because we don't know what is coming, although we can all have assessments of it. I think John um, b- believes that there'll be some big sell-off. I've been on the radio saying, listen, I'm guaranteeing a 50% drop in the markets. I just don't know when. It's coming at some point. I think it's a natural flow. When we come back, Doc, let's talk about your perception or, or thoughts about what might be the big red flags that this market is in fact rolling over? I know we saw a pretty volatile week this week in the markets. Thursday and Friday was just brutal for those of you who are bullish in the markets. But is this a uh, the beginning of a much bigger downside move? Or are there other red flags out there that we can look for uh, and start to build a bigger position or even start to go bearish in this market? I know some of you are probably still just holding those reins and being very, very bullish out there. Well, look, if this sell-off continues, if this negativity persists, and also if the institution's selling, which is what we're seeing a lot of right now, continues, these markets could be much, much lower going forward. So we'll look at that week back with Robert Murphy after a short break. If you have questions for John O'Donnell or myself, Power Blast is out of PowerTradingRadio.com or go out to Twitter. It's at Trader Marone. We'll be right back. You've been listening to Power Trading Radio live fueled by online trading academy to learn more visit us online at powertradingradio.com hello everybody welcome back to power trading radio tis our weekend edition our guest today is robert murphy and we were talking a little bit earlier uh, about a class that he's going to be teaching april 24th i would encourage you guys to check that out and tj if you wouldn't mind bring up uh, our screen over here we've got the website you can go to academy.mises.org for a list of classes obviously a lot of gr- other great classes as well uh, this one is entitled how the government wrecks the economy pretty reasonably priced there as well it's six lectures um starting april 24th and continuing oh well, that's that's interesting we got a Totally different chart there. Huh. That's cool. It should have been this one. I don't know what happened there. But um, here we have the, the website for it again. Go to academy.mises.org. It's called How the Government Wrecks the Economy. Robert Murphy will be presenting that one. So definitely take uh, note of that and attend that one. Robert, before the break, I was talking about current markets. Um, we talked at the beginning of the year on how we all expect just dramatic volatility. We're really seeing that happen here, especially in, in April. Um, a pretty negative week this week. What are some of the signs? I know you you kind of made it sound like there will be a day of reckoning. Are we seeing that now? Or is this just a false little pullback here? Or do you see uh, maybe some bigger signs down the road? And what should we look for? Well, I, I mean, this very well could be the, the beginning of it. All I can say is, I mean, I'm not claiming to be an expert in terms of timing. <laughs> but I do think that, to put it this way, that there's no reason that the underlying profitability of American firms has increased that much since... 2009 that I if you like chart the S&P 500 against the Fed's balance sheet you can see that this huge surge in stock prices almost moves hand in glove with the Fed's quantitative easing programs and so if you don't think that the Fed creating a bunch of money and and buying treasury bonds and mortgage backed securities is the way to promote prosperity then that should alarm you yeah. And I don't know when it's going to break. So I guess one way of putting it is I think that the dollar and the stock markets right now are in a bubble. And when does it pop? Well, I, I don't know. If everyone thought like I did, it would pop immediately. But obviously, a lot of people <laughs> disagree with my view. So um, one thing I, that I do think is going to make this this illusion have to burst is if and when the commercial banks start expanding their lending again, because as I'm sure you you know, there's a huge amount of what's called excess reserves right now in the commercial banking system that they have the legal ability to lend to make new loans and set in the quantity of several trillions of dollars, and they just haven't done that because they, there's you know, no good loans to be made at this at this point. So if the economy ever does seem to be improving and the commercial banks start expanding their lending, well then you're going to see tremendous pressure on prices so that the Fed's going to have to do something, raise interest rates, what have you. And then I think the, the day of reckoning is going to have to come. 
Yeah, it's that day yeah. that I think so many of us are looking forward to. <laughs> well, look, there's going to be an end game. I, I think it's it's certainly gone on a lot longer. If we had this, we could have had a similar conversation in 2000. Sure. We certainly could have had a similar conversation in 2007 peak. Uh, I think it's gone on much longer than any Austrians expected that it could. Um, uh, I don't know what Murray Rothbard was thinking back in the day, or what Mises must have thought when we went off the gold standard in August of 1971, but he had to think, geez, we've got to be getting closer to the end game. Uh, and, <laughs> but here we are, 40 years later, uh, still having the same conversation. So, Absolutely. you know, it's, I guess it's the way the market works. Yeah, no, totally. You know, uh, Robert, I put your book up on my Twitter feed. You mentioned uh, the book is called Lessons for the Young Economist. If you go out to at Trader Merlin, you can get the link to uh, Mises.org where the book is there. Um, it's uh, a free book out there for you. I definitely encourage you to read that one. And again, uh, hopefully, let's see if we can get TJ to bring that image up if this comes up here. It's called How the Government Wrecks the Economy. This is the uh, class that will be taught online April 24th through May 29th. Six lectures. Robert Murphy will be the host of that one. Robert, thank what's you. what's that URL? URL is academy.mises.org. I'll actually post it on the uh, my Twitter feed as well. So check out Trader Merlot in there, and we'll get to that one. So, Robert, thank you so much for coming on the program and, and making it easy for us on our maiden voyage here at our new studio. Well, I, again, best of luck to you guys, and thanks for having me. Thanks. Well, hopefully we'll get you, you out here in California one of these days. Keep up the fight, Robert. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I'd love to come. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Mises Academy podcast. To enroll in online courses, to access other episodes of this podcast, or for more information, visit academy.mises.org.